even more difficult than bringing one in. And of course, that clock has started ticking again. Coming in and out of port, we're under more stress than when we're sailing out in the open sea. And we've got deadlines to meet, sailing schedules. He wants us there at a certain time, we can't get there. And it all adds to your level of stress. Hey, chips. Hey, chips. Hey, chips. As with arrival, Captain Llewellyn shares command with Zamil Nair, the pilot. In these confined waters, the bow thrusters get a full-blown workout. Nair uses all his experience, first reversing the Atlanta before the tugboat with all of her 4,000 horsepower helps spin the Atlanta away from the docks and points her in the right direction. Steady as she goes. Dingle four, pilot, dingle four. Steady, steady, steady. Dingle four. With the Atlanta slowly increasing speed and safely on her way, Nair now needs to meet up with another incoming ship. It's a transfer that involves a hair-raising climb, followed by a brave leap to the pilot boat, all at a speed of over eight knots. One slip could be his last. By his calculations, it's a leap of faith that he performs as many as eight times in one working day. Once the Atlanta is out in open waters, Captain Llewellyn resumes sole command of his megaship. It will take the Atlanta two and a half days to sail to Hong Kong from Singapore, traveling a distance of over 1,460 nautical miles. That's a lot of time at sea. Time that's taken up with regular maintenance and a strict timetable. You must have a routine. You're keeping yourself ready and waiting for the next challenge. Once a week, Captain Llewellyn, the first mate, and the bosun carry out inspections of every section Hello. of the Atlanta's living quarters. Home entertainment here, Chief, mate. Home from home. Home from home. For the captain, the giant can only run efficiently if attention is paid to every tiny detail. That applies to every inch of the ship. While the crew's quarters are checked, the crew themselves have their own inspections to carry out. Electricity is crucial for all the ship's operating systems. The engineers are responsible for keeping all five 3,000 kilowatt generators running smoothly. Without them, the Atlanta would be dead in the water. The refrigerated containers also rely on electricity. The crew have to check the temperature of every single reefer twice a day. It's a full-time job to keep perishables like the Australian seafood in tip-top condition. And guess what? The Atlanta can carry over 700 of these refrigerated units. Although the Atlanta is surrounded by water, none of it, of course, is drinkable. Every drop of fresh water on board is made by turning seawater into drinking water. The ship's desalination plant can treat 30,000 liters a day, but it has to be cleaned regularly. Salt builds up on plates, which have to be stripped, cleaned, and put back into operation quickly. Another thing that's crucial to life on board is food, plenty of it, and it has to be kept fresh. The Atlanta has its own mini reefers in the living section. This is the bedroom. This cookie looks after everything absolutely perfect. It's one of the best I've been with. It sets everything out, it rotates, it keeps his storerooms immaculate. A key member of the crew who's hardly seen and seldom heard, but is crucial for harmony on board, is the cook. He orders and prepares all the food and has to come up with a menu that'll keep all 22 men of varied cultural backgrounds happy. 
22 meals three times a day, seven days a week. And he does the washing up. For the captain, sharing meals with the crew is about far more than just the food. One of the beauties is to bring them all together, to sit down and eat together. And you make them feel part of the team. If you don't have a team, you can forget this life. You must work as a team. If there's ever a time when a good team spirit is needed, it's tonight. The ship is entering dangerous waters. The security level has been raised. The South China Seas are busy with all sorts of craft. Many are small fishing boats, miles from shore. Some, however, may not be at all interested in fishing. Pirates trawl these waters, looking for the ultimate catch. Heading on 308, sir. Well, they're there. You don't know where they are, but they're there. They're watching all the time. So it's, it's a threat. We know that threat. Official figures show there can be three pirate attacks every two weeks in these waters. Third mate, I've got two targets here. And these guys that come aboard, if they can get aboard, they're ruthless. They'll kill for the US dollar. Modern pirates don't wear eye patches and don't carry daggers between their teeth. Today, they carry machine guns, AK-47s and M-16s, and travel in high-powered speedboats. Three, five, two, three miles. We're a soft target. We're easy. We're not armed. We're just easy. They know that. Starboard 20. Starboard 20. Low aft, low aft. Grace, number one mechanic, reporting. Yeah, this is Bridge here. We've got a target now. He's moving at 32 knots. He's coming down the port side. If you see anything, let me know. This is the captain. All crew members to your pirate stations. All crew members to your pirate stations. The crew have to be ready to defend their ship. The pirates have one of two aims, either to take the crew hostage, or more commonly, to steal any money or valuables that might be on board. The pirate's strategy attack the ship's blind spot. They head for the aft deck. This is the lowest part of the ship and the most vulnerable. As I'm taking evasive action now, I'm going port 20, I'm going port 20, midships, midships. If the captain can't outmaneuver the marauders, their only defense, high pressured water cannons. Their only hope, washing the attackers into the sea before the pirates can get aboard. Luckily for the crew, tonight turned out to be another close call. The fast-moving vessel was just a fishing boat crossing paths with the Atlanta. But if it's not one threat, it's another. The wind is freshening. The seas are rising. Intense tropical storms of the typhoon season command respect and demand a response. The captain can either skirt the storms, burning more fuel and losing time, or take them head on. This time, he decides to take the risk. No matter the weather, the crew still have to attend to their duties. The reefers still have to be checked even if it means braving winds up to 70 knots. It's in conditions like these that the power supply to the reefers could fail, spelling disaster for our precious cargo of Australian seafood. At the moment, the reefers are still working. Storms can severely reduce visibility, but heavy rain also plays havoc with navigation equipment. The squalls create unreadable blotches on the radar screen. The danger, there are times when the crew of the Atlanta are almost sailing blind.
The Atlanta is weathering the storm, which is losing intensity. The captain's instinct was right, and his gamble to take on the storm is paying off. But now, she still has to make Hong Kong by midnight. The rest of her journey depends on it. It'll take the Atlanta 42 days to complete the full circuit from Southeast Asia to California and back again. It's a mega trip, even for a mega ship. In a year, the Atlanta sails over 260,000 kilometers, which is roughly two thirds the distance to the moon. Five miles to our next one, five miles. Yeah, three. 313, yes. I Our megaship, the size of an aircraft carrier, now has to navigate Hong Kong's congested waters. Starboard then. At night, the bridge is not only the brains of the ship, it also becomes the Atlanta's eyes and ears. 350, two miles, stop. When a vessel registers on the Atlanta's radar, it's identified by a number and its direction and speed can be tracked by those watching from the bridge. It's another crucial piece of technology that helps a mega ship maneuver gracefully into a mega port. Bringing the Atlanta into another of the world's busiest ports at night means this small crew have to work together with maximum efficiency once again. It's just before midnight. In any 24-hour period, as many as 100 container ships sail into this harbor. The Atlanta is the last of the day. As at all the ports on the Atlanta's route, space at the dock is tight. Container ships bustle for space in this incredibly congested harbor. In a year, over 22,000 container ships move over 20 million 20-foot containers through this port. Once alongside, the winches take up the slack. The last thing anyone wants is two megaships wrestling for space. After more than two weeks of travel, this is the final destination for two particular pieces of cargo. The reefer containing the Australian prawns is whisked off the ship. Not far behind is the container packed with 999 cartons of Australian wine. Containers carrying both the prawns and wine reach a cargo warehouse. This is the telling moment. The frozen seafood has passed through the tropics, crossed the equator, and arrived, still frozen after two and a half weeks at sea. By the time the seafood has been unpacked, the Atlanta has taken on her load for America, and fully laden, she sails on. On the bridge, the captain and second mate Law plot the ship's next long journey across the Pacific Ocean. Having made a long and perilous journey of their own, all 999 cases of wine have arrived intact and on time. In a year, the Atlanta will carry over 185,000 containers at an estimated value of over four and a half billion dollars. The Australian seafood and wine are just a tiny fraction of all the goods that this megaship will transport around the globe. 